Hello everyone. Welcome to the first lecture of module two, which is on SRAMs. In the last lecture, we were discussing about the memory market, the trends, and the projections. We also discussed about what are the qualities or typical characteristics of the ideal memories that we want. In this lecture, we would be going ahead and looking at how basically these large memory arrays are organized. So the disclaimers remain the same. Now, before going to the you know organization of large memory arrays, let us look at some other memory classifications apart from the ones that we did in the previous lectures. So we also have a classification which is known as foreground versus background. So foreground memories are those memory elements which are right next to the logic block or the processing code. Examples can be registers or cache memory, and background memory are those memories which are away from the logic or off chip memory as you know we discussed last time. So what are the examples? Examples are DRAM, SSDs, HDDs, or flash memories, right? There is another classification based on how we can access data from these memory elements. And that is based on, you know, either the data access is random, for instance, which is the case for random access memories and read-only memories, or it is sequential access, which is the case with magnetic tapes, last in, first out, first in, first out memories, and so on. So what basically mean, what basically this means is in random access memories we can actually access data from any location in one cycle however in sequential access memories we have to actually you know uh, take out data serially and we have to wait till the data that we want comes out of that you know uh, memory element so that is the main difference between random access memory and sequential access memory needless to say random access memories are the ones which are dominating the market and these are you know uh, the ones that we actually desire. Then the memories can also be classified in terms of the property, as in whether we can read and write both into the memory or we can only read from the memory. So this read-only memory or ROM is a concept which you know is now used only for storing secret keys or identity. But earlier these ROMs were very popular. However, nowadays even ROMs come with this writing problem, like writing uh, kind of capability. And read-write memories, we all, we all are familiar with SRAMs, DRAMs, you know, other emerging non volatile memories, which are also RAMs. And like one flavor of this read-only memory, which is called E square PROM or electrically erasable, like ROM. So nowadays, these ROMs, I mean, whenever you purchase a mobile phone, you'll see that it has got like, you know, uh, typically 6 GB to 8 GB RAM, and you'll see some ROM. That ROM is not read-only memory. Now you can even program that room. I mean, you can also write to that room, and that room typically now has been replaced by flash memory. It's no longer, you know, the conventional rooms which were actually written at the time of chip manufacturing and then only read. Nowadays, they have been like they have been replaced by these flash memories. So let us look at these rooms in some detail. So what happens in these rooms or read-only memory is that the data is written at the time of chip design or chip manufacturing. And nowadays, typically, these only store keys for identification. In some devices, maybe they can, you know, store even the boot time information and something. But typically, nowadays, ROMs are not that used. Eventually, I mean, people realize that we need this programming capability even in the ROMs. So they came up with this PROM first, which is a programmable ROM. And then once it was, a, we were able to program it. People realized that you know we also should be able to erase it and reprogram it. Then they came up with this EP ROM or erasable programmable ROM. In this, they used to you know, use UV rays in order to erase the data from it. And that was quite complicated, right? Exposing your chip to the UV rays. So then they came up with this method of electrically you know, erasing this. And this was known as E square P ROM or electrically erasable programmable ROM. So what are the different you know, ways in which we can make these ROMs? So we can use simple you know, basic elements, basic circuit elements to make these ROMs. So we have several flavors of these rooms. We have diode rooms, we have MOS rooms. So let's see what happens. So what exactly happens in all these memories is that you have a word line and a bit line, and they're typically orthogonal to each other. And bit line is something from where you extract the data, right? And word line is something with where you kind of give the address of the data. So basically what happens in a diode room is, logic level one correspond to a diode connecting the word line to the bit line. And logic level zero corresponds to no diode. So why exactly so? So if there's a diode between the word line and the bit line, and you apply, and, or you select this word line by applying a select signal high here, what happens through this diode, this voltage even goes to this bit line, 
and your bit line also turns on or bit line also shows you value one if your word line is status however here regardless of whatever value you give to the word line your bit line won't show any data. since there is no connection between word line and bit line regardless of whatever value whether you select this word line or not bit line will stay at its original value similarly when you talk about this most from most from flavor one then here you see that you know a mosfet is connected between the word line and the bit line such that the word line is feeding the gate of the mosfet and the bit line is actually connected at the source and its drain is connected to vdd so what happens in such kind of flow is when word line is asserted high or when this word line is selected then this mosfet starts conducting and it kind of connects this bit line to vdd however you know that you know nmos doesn't pass a perfect one if this word line is only vdd if this is vdd plus vth this is bootstrap then it's fine i mean the there is a vth loss when you know you pass a logic one through nmos therefore you know whenever you select this word line what happens this nmos kind of you know uh, passes or connects this bit line to this vdd if this is if this word line is like if this vwl is vdd plus vth this bit line voltage is vdd however if there is no mosfet connected regardless of whatever you select the bit line will remain at its original position in the second flavor of this mos room how the data is stored is logic level 1 is stored as no data in between you know uh, no mos in between wl and vl and if there is a mos connected between bit line and word line then it corresponds to logic level 0 how so here the arrangement is different here what we do is the gate is still feeding the like the gate is still fed fed by this word line but now this bit line is connected to the ground whenever this word line is selected and as such the bit line goes low hence this is used to store data zero it will be clear when i discuss you know the array level design so what exactly happens in this array level design is let's say we have we take this nor type arrangement i mean there are several arrangements of these elements here i am taking the case of this mos from 2 because we have these ground lines in between and i am taking the arrangement which is typically called mos nor like it's called mos nor rom so here what we have is we have several of these bit lines bit line 0 bit line 1 bit line 2 and bit line 3 and each of them is connected to vdd with the help of these p mosfets which have a grounded gate this is like a pseudo nmos logic right where you know you are already uh, connecting these bit lines to logic level high by connecting by having these p mosfets which are turned on by connecting their gates to ground now how does this store data so let's say we want to check the data which is stored at wl0 we know that you know whenever we have no connection between wl and bl it's logic level 1 and whenever we have a mosfet in between wl and bl then it's logic level 0 so let's say we assert wl0 high so what we read here this is one because there is no connection and this will be one because this bl is directly connected to vd now we when we go to bl1 then what happens this wl0 since it's one this mosfet will try to connect this bit line to the ground line and hence reduce the voltage on it towards ground i mean if its driving strength is larger than this you know pulling up strength then definitely this will be able to pull it towards the ground and hence the data that you'll read here would be zero so what you'll read here when wl0 is asserted high you'll read a one then a zero on this line and then a one and one because these two lines are still connected to vdd and there's nothing pulling them to the ground similarly if you assert word w1 wl1 or word line 1 high this will kind of pull this bit line zero towards ground so the data that you will read will be zero 1 1 and again zero similarly if you assert wl2 high the data that you will read will be 1 0 1 0 and so on right if you assert wl3 then you will read a 1 1 1 1 so like this the data is actually you know pre programmed on your you know uh, ic and you just have to you know assert these word lines or go to these word lines assert them high in order to read that data and since these mosfets are fabricated on the chip you cannot reprogram them so that is one problem and that is the reason now people have started using flash memories which are reprogrammable in order to you know generate these roms okay now let us look at how these individual memory cells are organized as memory arrays in your typical computing systems so here we have a single bit which is stored in a memory cell so this is actually a memory cell it has got a select line data select line and a data port or io port through which we access the data 
so whenever we you know whenever the select signal goes high then whatever data is present here you can read it or write it through this data port now typically we do not have you know uh, we do not work with individual memory cells first we organize these bits in the form of words for any practical application and each of these words have this unique address so for instance here what we have done is here we have you know uh, organized w bits or w memory cell as a single word we have a unique address to select this word which is again its select line and in terms of data access we have w uh, you know w bit data port here to access a word the data from data content of a word which is having w bits and you know the best part is that the complexity of any system can be judged by the number of you know bits in its word which it can handle at a time so you have nowadays 32 bit system 64 bit system it simply represents the word length with which your system computes and as i discussed each of these words are addressed via a single uh, you know data line and this kind of represents this is kind of a compact representation of any word so you have this data select line or a select line and then you have these you know uh, different w data boards it's actually this data for this data access you have a buffer or a data buffer with w bits of w bits but we represent this by this uh, w simply like this instead of having you know these w lines emerging out of it so this is a simple representation of any word now how do we like let's say we have a very large memory let's say we have a n word memory i mean the number of words that we have to store there is n and each word consists of m bits so how do we organize it so let's say instead of w bits you have m bits here in each word and you have n such memory elements n such words n such words and each word has m bit information so how do you organize it the most intuitive way is to you know stack them on top of each other right so the most intuitive way that will come to your mind will be stacking these words on top of each other and then you you know get a structure which is like this right so here you have these individual lines or unique address of each word for addressing these words and then you have a single data port if you want to access let's say this word one then you simply assert a high on this s1 select line or data select line and then whatever content of word one is there you can then write it or read it with the help of the drivers which are present at this data port and then you can bring the data to this data buffer consisting of m bit or something like that i mean whatever you want to do with the data you want to read it you want to write it you can do it once you assert the select line for this particular word this is good this is kind of you know it's intuitive and it is good when the number of these words are small i mean when this n is small then you'll have you know so how many data select lines you have in this case so you have n select lines for n words or you have one select line for each of the words so you have n select lines for n words this is a good strategy if the number of words is smaller but let us take a simple case of you know 1 mb 1 megabyte mb so there let's say we have 1 mega words that is 2 power 20 words and each word is 8 bit or 1 byte long then what what would we need we would need 1 mega address lines or 1 mega of these select lines you know select a particular word out of those like out of that 1 mega word memory so that makes our life difficult why because then there is a routing complexity right we have to route these 2 to the power 20 lines on a chip and at the same time you need 2 to the power 20 number of pins in order to access those words so in short if you if the number of these words is huge then this kind of stacking is not a good solution or this kind of skewed aspect ratio is not a good solution what we should have is we should have something which reduces the number of select lines right because this creates a routing issue it's very difficult to route large number of lines on a chip because we have limited number of metal line layers when you are doing the layout also we have a limited number of pins i mean typical packages on which like in which these chips are packaged they consist of like 48 pins 64 pins and so on but you know getting a chip with 2 to power 20 pins that is you know impossible 
So we have to reduce the routing problem. We have to address the routing issue. We have to address or reduce the number of things. How can we do that? Here comes the role of decoder or the row decoder. So what this row decoder does, it kind of reduces the number of address bits that, that is required to select these words by a factor of log two. So now instead of n select lines, you need log base two n lines. I mean here. So instead of, you know, having these n lines over here, instead of having n select lines to choose these n words, with the help of this decoder, row decoder, you kind of reduce the number of bits that are required or the number of lines that are required to log base two of n. So now you just require k bit address, where k is equal to log base two of n, to address each of these words in this kind of memory. So this row decoder simplifies your life significantly. It reduces the number of pins and the number of wires to be routed by a factor of log base two, right? Or I would say in a log, log, logarithmic style because log base two factor of log base two is not a correct thing to say. So it reduces your effort by log base two of n, where n, n was the actual number of words which was stored in your memory. So this way you reduce the number of pins you reduce the number of address bits that are required to select each of these words just by introducing this row decoder. However, there's one essential requirement for this row decoder design that its pitch should be mapped. It, its pitch should be matched with the memory block. What do we mean by that? Whenever you are making layouts, you should ensure that, you know, uh, the dimension of this row decoder in this direction should be same as the dimension of the memory block in this direction. In the vertical direction. Why do I say so? Because if it is pitch matched, then the interconnect lengths would be very small, right? You won't have to go for you know diagonal interconnects and so on, and these interconnect lines won't be crossing and so on. If these are pitch matched, then the interconnect length would be typically very small. The number of pins is always less. I mean that we have already ensured with the help of the decoder. But pitch matching will help you to reduce the interconnect length between this row decoder and your memory block. That way, you kind of reduce the wire delay, and you'll also delay. You'll also reduce the wire losses. Why loss? Because these wires typically have some resistance, and on those resistances, some amount of voltage also drop. So effectively, you do not, you know, if you want VDD to be uh, going to this word zero, effectively, what happens? Some amount of voltage is dropped across this wire, which is connecting, you know, uh, your source of VDD to this word zero. And because of that, effectively, the voltage which reaches word zero is not VDD. I mean, this is just an example. So essentially, when you are pitch matching the peripheral circuit with your memory block, you are reducing the interconnect length, and hence you are reducing the wire delay and your losses, right? And your basically IR losses or the drop losses, like voltage drop losses across the interconnects. Although we have pitch matched this row decoder in this direction and reduce the interconnect length significantly. However, if you look at this direction, I mean, in this direction, we have very small interconnect lengths, right? Because of the pitch matching in this direction. However, along this vertical direction, if we have to, you know, access word zero, if this data buffer here or, you know, uh, the data port here has to access word zero, it has to traverse a long distance going from word n minus one till word zero. So the wire length here is very large. So what happens? There is a like signal integrity issue. A lot of signal, like a lot, it not only uh, is delayed, like data coming from word zero is not only delayed, but there is a signal integrity issue. That is a huge amount of signal voltage is lost via this transmission through the interface. So this kind of high aspect ratio, even in one direction, like this kind of high aspect ratio, leads to a large interconnect length in one direction and it introduces a significant delay as well as data integrity issues. So to mitigate this, what's the best solution? The best solution is to go for an aspect ratio of one. That is the column and row size should be same. And at the same time, so as I was saying, the best way to, you know, mitigate this issue is to have an aspect, a memory organized such that the aspect ratio is one such that the number of row lines is equal to the number of column lines. And this way we'll be able to, you know, uh, 
uh, reduce the you know uh, interconnect delays significantly. So let us see how that can be done. So what we have here is is a two-dimensional array of memory cells, right? So don't you know we get overwhelmed just just by looking at this. Let me tell you how exactly you know things are working here. So here what we have is we have a two-dimensional array of memory cell such that it is organized in the form of a square where we have equal number of rows and column lines. Now we have a row decoder with n address lines. So if there is if the row decoder has n bit address line, then it simply means that there are two rows for n different rows in this memory array, right? This is the first information. Second information is that we have a word length w. Since the word length is w, what we typically do is in such you know uh, in such array design, what we do is we typically partition these array into w pages. So page p zero p one to p w minus one, these are different pages of these memory arrays. And how many pages are there? As many pages as the word length is. There. Since here is here the word length is w bits, so we partition this memory array into w different pages, right? Now what we do is one bit of one word is stored in each page. For instance, if we are storing, let's say, some you know some uh, like let's say some word in this memory location. The first bit of that word is stored in page zero, second bit in page one, third bit in page two, and wth bit in page w. That is how we store any word in such memory arrays, two-dimensional memory arrays. So first we partition the memory array. Into different pages. How many pages? As many pages as the word length. Then, how do we store the data? We store one bit of each word in each of the pages. Unlike the traditional pages, where you know, unlike the traditional concept of pages in a book, where we have all the data together. In memories, what we do? We kind of you know arrange these data in such a way that one bit of a word is in a particular page. So P zero. Let's say first bit of a word. P one second bit of the word, P W minus one W -th bit of the word. That is how we store you know any word in this kind of two D array. Now to read this, what we do is we use column decoders. How many column decoders? As many column decoders as there are number of pages. So here since we have W pages, so we have W like we have W column decoders. And what these column decoders do? These column decoders simply select one line out of the several lines in this page. So there are several of these lines along this row direction, which are being selected by this row decoder. Now there are several of these column lines also, right? Now there are some several of these lines along this column also. How can we select one of the lines from one page? We use a column decoder. Let's say the column decoder has m inputs. If the column decoder has m inputs, then how many lines are there? Two raised power m, and this column decoder will select one line out of those two raised power m total lines. Right. So let's say we have m bit address for each column decoder, and how many of these column decoders are there? There are w column decoders, one corresponding to each page. Right. Now, the same column address is given to all the column decoders, so that you select the same bit from each of these pages. Right? And how many lines are from? So, if there are m number of bits, m m bit address given to this column decoder, it has to select, or there are total two power m lines, and it has to select one of them from it. Right? That is how it works. Now, since the same address is given to all the columns, what exactly happens? The same line from each of these pages is selected. So this gives you an additional, you know, density. Why? Because now in one row, let's say you have several of these words stored. First bit of first page 
first bit or first line of first page second line of second page dot 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 first no sorry first line of first page first line of second page first line of wth page let us see let us say that that represents word 1 now word 2 how can that be stored second line of page 0 second line of page 1 dot 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 second line of page w minus 1 you give that particular address and then second line of both all of these pages will be selected and that word will be read so typically how exactly your uh, like mem like words are addressed you have a particular you know row ad row address which is n bit and then you have a particular column address which is m bit so total number of bits or total number of address bits is 0 to n plus m minus 1 or n plus m address bits that is how you do it right now the thing is let's say if the signal has to come so what what is the farthest signal from these decoders this is the farthest you know p0 is the farthest page or this corner of p0 is the farthest location from the row decoder as well as the column decoder for column decoder also it should be pitch matched i mean all these w column decoders so should be designed such that they are pitch matched to this horizontal direction of your memory array so that you reduce this interconnect length. these interconnect lengths are reduced however the lines or the data which is stored in this corner in this far end which is far from this row decoder as well as from the column decoder what happens the signal from there traverses a large interconnect length while coming to these column decoders as well as while you know selecting that also the signal from the row decoder will traverse a large distance and there would be a huge interconnect loss also you know there would be a delay so because of that there is a signal integrity issue the signal which has to be read from here that will degrade as it passes through the interconnect and for that purpose we use this sense amplifier what this sense amplifier does this sense amplifier simply latches it to one of the two rails either vdt or ground and this sense amplifier leads to or it introduces rail to rail space and it also increases the speed now each of these lines here each of these row lines each of these lines along the horizontal direction they are called word lines right and each of these lines along the column direction these are known as bit lines now how many word lines are there if we have n bit row address then we have to raise for n rows here so we have to raise for n word lines now if we have w words so we have w pages and we have w of these column decoders right and if one column decoder address is m bit then we have to raise for m columns in one particular page so you have to raise for m bit lines in one particular page what is the total number of bit lines it's 2 to power m into w and ideally what do we want ideally we want that the number of lines along the horizontal direction should be same as the number of lines along the vertical direction or in short aspect ratio should be one so ideally what we would like to have is we would like to have the number of rows equal to the number of columns so we choose our w m and n such that this condition is satisfied right we need equal rows and columns to maintain this aspect ratio of one so this is how you know uh, any words like any word is organized in your 2D array, which has an aspect ratio of one, so that your uh, row decoder and column decoders are pitch matched, and you have least interconnect, you know, uh, line length along these two directions. Now the question is, how to read or write data from or into the array? So that is also very simple. What we do is first we give this address. So what is the address? Address is n plus m bit long. First n bits are you know fed to the row decoder, and based on those n based on that n bit address, it selects a particular row. Like here, this row has been selected, or this word line has been selected. Now that m bit address of the column, when that feeds this column decoder, what happens? A particular a particular line or a particular bit line from each page is selected. So we have W column decoders, and each of these column decoders are being fed with M bit address. 
So one line, one column from each of these page will be selected or one bit line from each of those pages will be selected. And this will be the same bit line from each page. Or I would say this would be the same, like the line would be same from each page or the order of the line would be same in each page. For instance, if it is like, if corresponding to this M bit address, second column of page zero is selected. Second column of page one will also be selected and second column of page W minus one will also be selected. So that last M bit, which is kind of fed to this W column decoder, it selects a particular WL location in each of these pages. And at the intersection of these word lines and bit lines, you have the cells which are being read or which you can write into. So at the intersection of these word lines and bit lines, you basically have the selected cells. And now the data can be read into these selected cells, read from these selected cells with the help of sense amplifier. If this, why this sense amplifier is required? Because if this is at the far end, there is a data integrity issue. I mean, there is a drop across the interconnect through which this data is coming into this column decoder. So the sense amplifier restores it to, you know, rail to rail swing. And that is how you are able to get a perfect kind of VDD or ground while reading. So for reading, you basically use the sense amplifier. However, if you want to write data into it, you basically write that data to this, you know, data buffer port and you bypass this sense amplifier. So there is an enable signal for the sense amplifier, which goes high only when it is in the read mode. In the write mode, that signal is disabled and this sense amplifier is not into the picture. You directly, write, you directly access these selected cells and change the data. So typically this is how you write any data into this array or read any data from this. So this concept of page is very important. And now I guess you know what exactly is a word line, what exactly is the bit line and what exactly are pages, what exactly are, you know, uh, these uh, like, you know, rows decoders, what exactly is the function of column decoders and how you obtain a W bit word out of this, you know, 2D array, which is having aspect ratio of one. Now the question is, what kind of, you, you know, you, can we make these arrays as large as possible? Having this aspect ratio of one, can we make these arrays very large? So the answer to that is, whenever you are, you know, selecting, whenever you are feeding an end bit address to this row decoder, you are actually activating all the cells in this particular word line, right? And based on this column decoder address, you are activating only few bit lines. And these are the cells whose data you are kind of, you know, uh, reading or writing. But when you are, you know, applying that n bit row address, you are activating all the cells in that row. And that leads to a large power dissipation, especially when, you know, your memory array is very large. So what exactly is the thing that limits the size of memory array? It's basically this power dissipation and the signal integrity issue and the access time. So signal integrity, you have a IR drop across the interconnect that leads to, you know, degradation in the signal as it passes from this extreme end towards this, you know, column decoder or towards this data port or data buffer. That is one. Also, it leads to a large amount of delay. Why delay? Because this interconnects not only provide a parasitic resistance, but they also provide a parasitic capacitance. So those parasitic capacitance will also be charged along the way. And because of that charging of parasitic capacitances along the way, when it traverses, when the signal traverses from this point to this column decoder and you know to, to this data port, there would be access delay as well. And due to these, if you know constraint is like you have to have this kind of fast access or you have to have uh, this speed of accessing the data, then that kind of limits the size of memory elements. You'll have to design or you have to find out the number of memory elements or the number of words, or I would say the, the size of the array in such a way that you have to, you know, uh, that you kind of satisfy that constraint. So it's actually signal integrity and access time along with this power dissipation, which limits the size of memory array when they are kind of, you know, organized in this as like in this fashion. So what is the you know solution? How can we realize even larger memory arrays? So what we can do is we can divide these large memories 
into smaller blocks. So this is like a divide and conquer approach. So what we do is instead of having a very large memory array like this, we divide this into smaller blocks, smaller blocks having aspect ratio of one with its local word line and local bit line such that their you know, interconnect length is very small, they are pitch match, the row decoder and column decoders are pitch match and their interconnect lengths are very small such that we have very fast access, we have less signal integrity issues and so on. However, the overhead here is that now along with these column decoders, we'll also need these block decoders to select which block, I mean to select the block in which we want to write the memory or write the data or from where we want to read the data. So this is an overhead, but that is pretty small as compared to the overall, you know, savings in terms of energy as well as speed, uh, like enhancement in the speed. So how do I, like, why do I say that there's an energy saving? So let's say I know that, you know, the data that I want to access multiple times is in this block. So what I do is I do not power on all these. I mean, I turn these other blocks off with the help of power gating. I only turn on this block and get my data through this or write the data into this block. So by this effective use of power gating for different blocks, I can, you know, save a lot of energy. So that kind of overhead of this block decoder is very small as compared to the amount of energy that we are saving or, uh, you know, the amount of increase in the speed that we are getting. So this kind of, you know, divide and conquer approach is very important and it's, you know, very uh, kind of amazing how the amount of savings that it brought brings is like, it's great. Now let us look at the role of peripheral circuitry. We already discussed that this row decoder helps us, this row decoder, this sense amplifier, they help us uh, to, you know, improve the efficiency of these memory blocks. Row decoder reduces the number of address lines. Your sense amplifier allows you to, you know, uh, work with degraded signals and increases the speed also. Typically, if you want, if from a digital circuit perspectives, what do you want in a circuit? So if you want to make these memories following all the constraints or following, you know, all the good design rules of digital circuits, then you would want to have a large output swing, typically rail to rail swing, a large noise margin, isolation of input and output, high input impedance and a low output impedance, typically infinite input impedance and, you know, zero output impedance so that you can support a large number of fan outs. And you would also want to operate at very high speed. So if you want to satisfy all these considerations from a digital circuit point of view, then you'll end up designing a memory element, which is having 22 transistors like this. There's a typical resistor and it has about 22 transistors. However, if a single cell, if a single memory cell is 22 transistors, it's large, then the amount of density or the number of bits that you can accommodate on one chip that you can store on one chip would be very small because for memories, we saw that area is one of the major constraints. We want the memory core to be as dense as possible, right? And in that case, having this 22 transistor large memory cell would be detrimental. Although it satisfies all these digital circuit considerations, it's good from all these considerations, but the density is pretty poor. And density is proportional to the cost, right? Higher the density, lower the cost. It's inversely proportional. So higher the density, lower the cost and vice versa. So what these digital, like what these memory designers do, they are very intelligent, they are very clever. What they do is they trade off these performances with the density. So they come up with, you know, simple memory cells, which lack or, you know, which are inferior from these considerations. But then to an external world, it doesn't appear that they are inferior. How? These, these memory designers, they make good use or they design intelligently the peripheral circuitry and they regain the performance. So whatever is a degradation in terms of these parameters by using a memory cell with a smaller number of transistors, they kind of make these peripheral circuitries so that when they attach this peripheral circuitry to that memory cell, to an external world, it doesn't appear that, you know, this memory block is lagging on these considerations. So let me explain that with the help of an example. So typically in SRAM cells, what they do is they reduce the output swing on BL. So you have a bit line and for reading or writing onto the SRAM cell, you kind of pre-charge that bit line or you feed the data on that bit line. So 
typically or you know if you have to satisfy these constraints you will have to provide you know the output string should be rail to rail on the bit line however these memory designers they use a reduced output string on bit line what that helps them to achieve first it helps them to achieve a reduced dynamic power because your dynamic power is you know proportional to you know uh, how much the voltage is changing on the bit line so that is one advantage in terms of power it also reduces the delay in charging and discharging the bit line capacitance so just by reducing the swing from rail to rail to you know a smaller amount they are gaining in power as well as they are gaining in speed however the external world it only understands the rail to rail swing for external world vdt is is logics 1 ground is logic zero in between if anything is there it considers that as noise especially when you are talking about digital circuits so if you are reducing the output swing on pl how do you ensure that the external world doesn't get to know it that is the role played by the peripheral circuitry we use a sense amplifier to regain this rail to rail swing and improve the speed so you know to an external world when we are reducing and like when we are reducing the output swing on bl just by using this sense amplifier we regain rail to rail swing and to the external world the output that we are getting or the data that we are reading is still vdd for logic 1 and ground for logic 0 so that is how by intelligently or cleverly designing these peripheral circuitries even when you have a memory element which is not you know performing best with respect to these considerations we can make the external world think that okay all these considerations are fulfilled and you know the memory block is perfectly designed we do not want we do not need to go for this 22 transistor memory cell we can work with a 6 transistor or even a 1 transistor memory cell and we can intelligently design the peripheral circuitries to kind of you know have robust memory cells or have robust memory array or memory design so memory designers typically they work on these cell designs they optimize the memory core the arrangement of these cells and also they make they make these you know uh, really good peripheral circuitries so that whatever simplistic cells they have made which are in, like having a larger density as compared to these good cmos you know cells they show equivalent performance with the help of these peripheral circuit 